Now I will introduce our distinguished guest. It is an honor to welcome to our festival, Linda Paston, a truly wonderful poet, whose 15 or more books of poems and essays are an enduring gift to American letters. She won her first poetry prize as a senior at Radcliffe. Sylvia Plath was the runner up that year. And she has won numerous awards since, including the Poetry Foundation's Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement, among the most prestigious awards that can be won by an American poet. Linda Paston's appearance here today is worthy of a fanfare of trumpets, but that would be utterly out of keeping with the nature of her poetry. Brassy is not an adjective that comes to mind. I have been reading what I believe is her most recent collection of new poems, Insomnia. How quiet and calm these poems are on the surface. They would be. They're mostly written in the still of the night, but there's so much going on beneath the surface. Let's look at just one example. I'll share my screen so that you can actually see it on the page. If I've done it right, you should be able to see it right now. Um, it's the first strophe of a poem titled A Brief History of Hurricane, Hurricane Lee. A minute before 5 a.m., the alarm clock slumbering in its bed of numbers, I wait for the storied wind and think of the quahog, snug in its house of shell as the gull approaches. No brass section there, only the sound of a human voice speaking quietly as no one is there to listen. But the passage presents an entire drama, beginning, middle, and end, in eight short lines. The beginning gives us the time, a minute before 5 a.m., the place, a bedroom, and an introduction to the protagonist, the poet who imagines a bed of numbers for the alarm clock to sleep in. The middle section shows the rising action, the approach of the storm that has been predicted, the poet visualizing a secure hiding place. I wait for the storied wind and think of the quahog snug in its house of shell but the end arrives unexpectedly in the middle of a line and changes everything as the gull approaches. Seagulls lift shells and drop them from a height to get at the clams inside. That imagined shell is not a good hiding place. And such wordplay there is in these eight lines. There's interior rhyme and slant rhyme and alliteration. The passage made of such utterly natural speech is so brimful of artistry, it's enough to make your head spin. To quote another of Linda Paston's poems, how complicated such simplicities are. But of course, insomnia is a problem after all, a problem that involves the whole person, not only the intellect, but including the intellect, the mind, must be occupied, counting sheep, counting grains of sand, counting all the many experts on the subject of sleep. And the sleepless mind is wild to make connections. The metaphors morph one into another. When the wind knocks over a poplar tree, the monstrous root ball torn from the earth becomes a great ball of yarn with knitting needles sticking out. And then, a labyrinthine subway rumbling under city streets. And finally, the secret map of blood under the skin. There's no separating what's out there from what's in here. The line between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind has worn thin. Here, as always, Linda Paston's subject is the interior life but she doesn't leave anything out. Well, let's welcome in our distinguished guest, Linda Paston, our final poet for this year's 
Literary Festival. Linda, if you would unmute and turn your video back on, of course, there again. <laughs> Great. Okay. And now, good. I'm going to make myself disappear now. Thank you. That was one of the nicest introductions I think I've ever had. Um, when I was first invited to this literary festival, I was promised a beautiful room and a beautiful New Hampshire Inn, um, which clearly was not possible these days. But it's been nice being in the spring in Maryland. It's been very beautiful here. Um, the dogwoods are all in bloom and they are my favorite tree. And I'm going to start tonight by reading the dogwoods. I remember in the week of the dogwoods, why sometimes we give up everything for beauty, lose our sense and our senses as we do now for these blossoms sprinkled like salt through the dark woods. And like the story of pheasants with salt on their tails to tame them, look how we are made helpless by a brief explosion of petals one week in April. And this is the week. Um, because I know so many people in the audience today are poets themselves, I thought I should read one poetry poem. This is Prosody 101. When they taught me that what mattered most was not the strict iambic line goose-stepping over the page, but the variations in that line and the tension produced on the ear by the surprise of difference, I understood, yet didn't understand exactly, until just now, years later in spring, with the trees already lacy and camellias blousy with middle age, I looked out and saw what a cold front had done to the garden, sweeping in like common language, unexpected in the sensuous extravagance of a Maryland spring. There was a dark edge around each flower as if it had been outlined in ink instead of frost. And the tension I felt between the expected and actual was like that time I came to you ready to say goodbye for good, for you had been a cold front yourself lately. And as I walked in, you laughed and lifted me up in your arms as if I too were lacy with spring instead of middle aged like the camellias. And I thought, so this is poetry. That, that was quite an old poem. I would be very happy to be middle aged right now. <laughs> anyway. Um, I've taken the opportunity of being more or less stuck at home for a whole year um, of putting a new book together. Um, I've written five books since my last um, new and selected poem, Carnival Evening came out. And so what I've done is put together a book that I'm calling almost an LG new and later selected poems. Um, and I just finished that manuscript last week. Uh, so I thought what I do tonight, I've never done anything like this, is to read one poem from each of the five early books that I've included and then end with a group of, of the new poems. Um, choosing 12 or 15 poems from each book out of the 40 or 50 was, was very hard because I know that when I go to a reading um, to give one, I just take my new and selected poems rather than carrying around five books. So in, in some ways I'm, I'm making the poems that I don't choose obscure, which is sort of too bad. Anyway, The Last Uncle, that's the book that came out right after Carnival Evening. The poem I'm going to read is the Cossacks for Fanny Smythe. For Jews, the Cossacks are always coming. 
Therefore, I think the sunspot on my arm is melanoma. Therefore, I celebrate New Year's Eve by counting my annual dead. My mother, when she was dying, spoke to her visitors of books and travel, displaying serenity as a form of manners, though I could tell the difference. But when I watched you planning for a life you knew you'd never have, I couldn't explain your genuine smile in the face of disaster. Was it denial laced with acceptance? Or was it generations of being English, Bronte's Lucy in Villette, living as if no fire raged beneath her dun-colored dress? I want to live the way you did, preparing for next year's famine with wine and music as if it were a 10 course banquet. But listen, those are hoofbeats on the frosty autumn air. The next book is um, Queen of a Rainy Country. That was a, um, a cover that I really enjoyed, I have to say. And I'm going to read um, a poem that's called Why Are Your Poems So Dark? I actually have a number of poems that I've written um, as answers to questions that I've gotten in Q&A sessions. And this one, I've gotten quite a bit. Why are your poems so dark? Isn't the moon dark too, most of the time? And doesn't the white page seem unfinished without the dark stain of alphabets? When God demanded light, he didn't banish darkness. Instead, he invented ebony and crows and that small mole on your left cheekbone. Or did you mean to ask why you said so often? Ask the moon, ask what it has witnessed. And next book is Traveling Light. Um, this, this poetry session today was, was sort of billed as underneath the ordinary. Um, so I'm going to read a poem called The Ordinary that I wrote as a kind of answer to people that I think were criticizing me for writing about such ordinary subjects. So this is my answer. The Ordinary. It may happen on a day of ordinary weather the usual assembled flowers or fallen leaves disheveling the grass. You may be feeding the dog or sipping a cup of tea and then the telegram or the phone call or the sharp pain traveling the length of your left arm or his. And as your life is switched to a different track, the landscape through grimy windows almost the same though entirely different. You wonder why the wind doesn't rage and blow as it does so convincingly in Lear, for instance. It's pathetic fallacy you long for, the roses nothing but their thorns, the downed leaves subjects for a body count. And as you lie in bed like an effigy of yourself, it is the ordinary that comes to save you. The china teacup waiting to be washed. The old dog whining to go out. And then insomnia. Um, I'm going to read the last poem in this book. <clears throat> it's called Musings Before Sleep. And the best line in this poem is the last line, which is really just um, a slight misquoting of an Auden line. So Auden is all through this poem. Musings Before Sleep. 
The lines on my face are starting to make me look like photographs of Auden in old age. If the lines of my poems could also be as incandescent as his, would I be willing to look as worn and wrinkled? I avoid mirrors now, particularly when the strong light of morning reveals what I don't wish to see. And sometimes I want to erase the words I'm putting down, even as my pen touches the paper. Sometimes I feel guilty about growing old and forgetful and sometimes guilty about spending so much time tinkering with language. Though tinkering isn't the word most writers would use, revision, we say, which is sometimes holy, and also something many women do, revise their faces with rouge or stitches. Are there two kinds of vanity? Vanity about the beauty we are born with or without, and vanity about the beauty we tried to make out of sticks and stones of language. Old age should be a time of accepting the hand dealt out, in fact, already almost played out. But in these moments when sleep is about to take me, when I might be any age at all, I think again of Auden, who for the length of a dream at least, may hold my all too human head in the hands that wrote those poems. And my last book is really just a tiny little book. It's called A Dog Runs Through It. And um, what I did was to go through all my 15 books and find any poem in them that, that had a dog even obliquely in the page and put them all together in this little book. And um, I also wrote a preface to the book about all the dogs of my life of dogs. Um, and I think I'm gonna read two poems here. This one is called The Animals. When I see a suckling pig turn on the spit, its mouth around an apple, or feel the soft muzzle of a horse eating a windfall from my hand. I think about the animals when Eden closed down, who stole no fruit themselves. After feeding so long from Adam's outstretched hand and sleeping under the mild stars flank to flank, what did they do on freezing nights? Still ignorant of nests and lairs, did they try to warm themselves with the fiery leaves of the first autumn? And how did they learn to sharpen fangs and claws? Who taught them the first lesson that flesh had been transformed to meat? Tiger and bear, elk and dove, God saved them places on the ark and Christ would honor them with parables calling himself the Lamb of God. We train our dogs in strict obedience at which we failed ourselves. But sometimes the sound of barking fills the night like distant artillery, a sound as chilling as the bellow of steers led up the ramps of cattle cars whose gates swing shut on them as Eden's did. <laughs> Just to lighten things up for a minute, um, this poem is called In the Garden. I tell my dog to sit and he sits and I give him a biscuit. I tell him to come and he comes and sits and I give him a biscuit again. I tell my dog lie down and he sits looking up at me with trust and adoration. I pause. I give him a biscuit. This is the beginning of love and disobedience. I was never meant to be a god. And now I'm going to read just a few of um, poems in the new section. This first one, I have a lot of poems based on, on art that I see in various museums and such. This is called Memory of a Bird, which is the name of 
um, A Watercolor by Paul Klee. Memory of a Bird. What is left is a beak, a wing, a sense of feathers, the rest lost in a pointless blur of tiny rectangles. The bird has flown, leaving behind an absence. This is the very essence of flight, a bird so swift that only memory can capture it. Sting. A bee stung the palm of your right hand, or did you touch a nettle? There was a swelling, the burn of pain, a poison flower blooming in the flesh, and neither ice nor baking soda helped. You carried it around, right hand and left, as if it belonged to somebody else, and you were angry, not at the possible bee whose buzz was all you knew of it, not at the nettle hidden scourge of the summer garden. It was the wound itself that angered you, an early soldier in the army of afflictions waiting for us, even in the innocent grass. Um, my new book is going to be called Almost an Elegy, and this is the title poem, which I wrote specifically for Tony Hoagland. Your poems make me want to write my poems, which is a kind of plagiarism of the spirit. But when your death reminds me that mine is on its way, I close the book, clinging to this tenuous world, the way leaves outside cling to their tree just before they turn color and fall. I need time to read all the poems you left behind, which pierced the darkness here at my window, but did nothing to save you. And this is class notes. My high school class of 1950 is disappearing over the edge of the world, a snowless avalanche. Rosalie, the pancake makeup. Alex, who I've ran us even towards death. Three Susans, two Davids, and a Roger. When I see our class representative's name on an incoming email, I think of how families must have felt during World War II when they saw the Western Union bicycle approaching. And I remember all of us lining up in gym class as captains chose their teams. The line would dwindle until on one leg then the other, I was standing almost alone. Maybe whoever is doing the choosing now thinks I would be no good at dying. The tourist, and I look forward to the time when I can be a tourist again, but the tourist. We saw the entrance to the underworld outside of Naples, just after eating pizza at that special place and before boarding the ferry for Capri. We could tick it off our list of sights to see, but there was nothing to see. Ground, bleached of features, colorless air. And remembering Odysseus and his journey here, meeting the ghost of his long dead mother, we felt cheated as if someone from our growing list of lost friends should have emerged to greet us. a few more. This is plunder to a young friend. On a day of windy transition, one season to the next, you spoke of helping your mother close her house, of the choices you had to make, what to discard, what to keep, as if it were your childhood itself waiting to be plundered. You kept a Persian rug, all reds and golds, to walk on every day, keeping the past alive under your feet. Those nested, rust, nested Russian dolls you played with as a girl, grandmother, mother, daughter, four bedwood chairs wrenched from their table. 
I listened thinking I'd be the next to try to crowd a lifetime of things into a shrinking universe of boxes. I've started dismantling my life already, throwing out letters from people I remember loving, choosing among books, this one to stay, that one to go, as if I were a judge sentencing some to death, the rest to the purgatory of the emptying shelf. Perhaps I should simply burn it all, but don't we live on in what we've left behind in the fading twilight of Kodak and our sterling knives and spoons tarnishing on a grandchild's casual table? Don't these become a kind of museum of the afterlife? The pharaohs had it right. They took their whole world with them, vases and chests, gilded statues, jewels, Plundered, perhaps, but not for a thousand years. Nefertiti's tomb has never been found. Okay, two more. This is instruction. You must rock your pain in your arms until it's asleep, then leave it in a darkened room and tiptoe out. For a moment, you will feel the emptiness of peace, but in the next room, your pain is already stirring. Soon, it will be calling your name. And I'm going to end with the, the final book in this new manuscript. It's a villanelle. Um, I do write many poems in strict form, but not a lot in the new section here. This is called The Future. When do we, <clears throat> let me start again, the future. When do we trade the future for the past? A farmer plows his fields one final time. I think each poem I write will be the last. The world grows small. It used to seem so vast. Retirees lie in bed till after nine. When do we trade the future for the past? They pull on trousers, sigh, and cut the grass. And I have lost the lust for making rhyme. I think each poem I write will be the last. The words come slowly now. They once came fast. Each fledgling ode becomes a hill to climb. When do we trade the future for the past? There's TV and the crossword. Days will pass. Walks on hard pavement, cities etched in grime. I fear each poem I write will be the last. Uncoupled metaphors go streaming past. The young are on their way. I watch them shine. When did I trade the future for the past? I think this poem I'm writing is the last. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Wonderful, wonderful poems all the way through. It was such a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. You know, uh, in the last two years, the, the two poets I would say I, I kind of discovered for myself, I mean, should have discovered you a long time ago, but you, you became a great favorite of mine over the last couple of years. And the other one, ironically, um, is Tony Hoagland, who you, so that's, it's funny. Right, I so, had discovered him late also. And then when I was at the Dodge Poetry Festival one year, we were both reading and we got to be good friends. And um, I love, love his work. Yeah. Yeah, a human, it's very human as yours is too. I mean, it's always, yeah. Well, that finishes our day, except for this evening's, um, it's my little event with Rena this tonight. Um, I hope that everyone will will try to get a look at that. You, if you're in the Newburyport area, you can watch it on Channel Eight, and if not, you can watch it via a, a link on the on the Newburyport Literary Festival website. And of course, tomorrow there's a whole other day of events, but no poetry events. This is the final poetry event here, except for our our mill up here, of course. So um, thank you. Thank you once again, Linda. Thank Wonderful you. to have met you, albeit digitally. 
Maybe, <laughs> maybe one year in New Hampshire we'll see each other. Yes. Okay. Take care. And goodbye, everybody. <laughs>